China is where some of the world's most primitive organisms appeared. This land has long been home to millions of animals and plants. One of these plant species is quite unique. It is very high in protein, a feature that decided its fate. Chinese people started domesticating this plant more than 8,000 years ago. It was one of the most extensively grown crops in the Central Plains. It journeyed out of its native land in the Tang Dynasty, linking plants, animals and mankind together in one big community. It is rather plain looking, but it is always ready to give. The soybean is the wild ancestor of the domesticated bean. Its shoots are entwined together, either crawling along the ground or climbing up the stems of other hardy plants. It is quite a low profile plant. It has been lying low all this time, waiting for autumn. The seed in its pods are now ready to grow into new plants. It must find a way to ensure that the seeds and the future of the family have a strong future. If it keeps its seeds close by, they will inevitably start competing with each other for light, nutrients and space. A family at war is one of the saddest things on earth. It needs to consider the interests of the family as a whole. What about sending its seeds away to spacious new homes to prevent sibling rivalry? This unpretentious plant houses a remarkable explosive power for seed dispersal. The pods crack open and the seeds inside are ejected from two to five meters away. This extraordinary performance is repeated year after year on this land and often goes unnoticed. Two meters, five meters, the seeds are flung away one after another, pushing the boundaries for their species. If given enough time, the wild soybean could expand its territory by hundreds of miles all on its own. However, catapulting the seeds is only the first step in the process. The mother plant has sent its seeds away as far as possible, and now the seeds must learn to survive in this merciless world on their own. For these vulnerable seedlings, even the slightest change in their environment could cause fatal damage. Attacks from birds and other animals could also easily end their lives. The world outside their pod is not that friendly. The seeds of the wild soybean have learnt to be patient. They take shelter in the soil, absorbing nutrients in preparation for the best moment to germinate. They may need to wait one year or two years or sometimes even decades. If all the seeds germinate at the same time, it could be disastrous. A flood or a drought could wipe out all the new seedlings at once. If they germinate at different times, at least some of the seedlings may survive. Survival of the species is the most important thing. The wild soybean's ultimate mission was to evolve and survive until it was adopted by humans. The wild soybean was able to claim more territory in a quicker and more efficient manner with the help of humans. 
But all this came at a price. They were first bred to stop ejecting their seeds. The pods became their tribute to humans instead of nurseries for their seeds. Now the soybean seeds lie submissively in their pods, waiting to be harvested. But of course, humans want more than that. People didn't like the way the wild soybeans grew, crawling along the ground. They wanted the plant to grow upwards, which would save space and leave the pods hanging in the air, making the job of identifying and collecting pods much easier. The wild soybean complied. This field of soybean plants is like a metropolis full of skyscrapers. Standing proudly, they are now a crop well protected by humans. I first spotted wild soybeans when I went plant hunting in the mountains. I thought it would be possible for us to grow it as a food crop. Mrs Wang, an ordinary Chinese farmer, as down to earth as the soybean she grows, is waiting for the results of her experiment. It can take a decade or more to successfully propagate a wild plant. It was the same kind of patience that allowed Chinese farmers in ancient times to domesticate and cultivate the wild soybean. Thousands of years have passed since then. Over the centuries, the wild soybean eventually yielded to people's patient efforts at cultivation. Domesticated soybeans were planted extensively and people gradually learned the right way to cultivate them. It was time for the soybeans to travel out of China to meet and conquer a bigger world. The first person to take soybeans outside of China was a venerable monk from the Tang dynasty called Jianzhen. Valuable records of Jianzhen's attempts to visit Japan over an 11 year period are stored at the Toshodaiji Temple in Japan. Monk Ninsho, who lived during the Kamakura period, created the illustrated scroll painting of the biography of Jian Zhen's eastern expeditions in honor of Jian Zhen. Jian Zhen set off from Yangzhou for Japan in 742 AD, but the voyage ended in failure five times. <laughs> He finally reached Japan on his sixth attempt. Determined to make the most of his time in Japan, he not only promoted Buddhism there, but also bought another gift for the local people. Tofu, a food that originated in China during the second century BC, has been introduced across the globe. The word tofu has stayed in many languages as a loan word, adopted from the Chinese. It is one of China's gifts to the world. Jianzhe not only propagated Buddhism here in Japan, but also introduced foodstuffs from China. Tofu was one of them. Bean curd made from soybeans can be used in many dishes. As well as promoting Buddhism, which is their main task, monks should also teach people how to live a happier life. That is very important too. 
During his stay in Japan, Jian Zhen not only made tofu for the monks in the temple where he was staying, but also taught ordinary people how to make it. Therefore, he is honored as the founder of Japan's tofu industry. He introduced things from China that we had never heard of before, so Japanese people still remember and respect him today. Soybeans were brought to Japan as the main ingredient of tofu. As an island country, Japan has few natural resources and soybeans were met with enthusiasm when they were first introduced. These tiny little seeds have been planted and cultivated here for centuries. After generations of improvement, tofu has established a dominant position in Japanese cuisine. My grandfather was a tofu maker and my father followed in his footsteps. Later he opened this tofu shop and now I've taken it over. Back in the Edo period, when Kazo Hattori's grandfather was still alive, the Hattori family became the official tofu provider for the venerable Nanzanji Temple. Monks at this temple still eat tofu made especially for them by the Hattori business. We feel duty-bound to make the best tofu as the exclusive tofu provider of the Nanzanji Temple. It's like our shop represents Kyoto in a way, and it is this sense of duty that inspires and motivates us. Established in 1910, the shoppers witnessed the Hattori family's effort to develop and improve their tofu products. The family has worked unceasingly to produce the best organic tofu in the land. Our shop has always adhered to the principle of bringing out the full original flavor of soybeans in our products. Three generations of the Hattori family have followed the tradition of making tofu with brine. The soybeans are soaked in salt water, crushed and then filtered until they have been reduced to smooth soy milk. We add brine to the soy milk while it is still fresh, and the milk will thicken into a homogeneous mass. With its original flavor preserved, we pride ourselves on our homemade tofu. Making tofu with brine is both time-consuming and exhausting, but Kazo Hattori refuses to adopt modern technology. He will not abandon the traditional method inherited from previous generations. Over a hundred years have passed since the shop was established, and its current owner still devotes himself to tofu making, just like his grandfather and father before him. We make tofu out of soybeans, which is both time-consuming and very tiring. We try to maintain their wonderful original flavor as a way to honor their sacrifice. Soybeans are used to make a variety of homely dishes in Japan, including tofu, natto, soy sauce, and miso soup. This soup contains miso, a seasoning made from fermented soybeans. The flavor of their mother's miso soup is something Japanese people hold dear to their hearts. The flavor largely depends on where one's mother was born. Miso soup from Kyoto tastes different from the soup made in Nagoya. How about we add a little more miso, just a little bit? Miso produced in different places have different flavors. Miso soup made from miso produced in your mother's hometown makes you think of her and all the dear memories you've shared together. Tofu has become the Hattori family's spiritual cuisine. They believe that food has healing powers, that it can provide a sense of security and happiness and relieve pain. The soybean is a gift from nature and we should accept it with gratitude. 
Soybeans set out from their homeland of China and travelled to Japan, where they found a new purpose in life. The meticulous, strong-willed Japanese have turned these protein-rich seeds into one of the most widely used ingredients in Japanese cuisine. Next, soybeans embarked on another epic journey to the distant shores of America. There is a city named Martin in Tennessee, USA, with a population of about 10,000 people and only one traffic light. However, the city is overwhelmed with a festive atmosphere in the first week of September every year, as a celebration of one special plant takes place. Yes, preachers for the soybean, hero of the land, from humblest beginnings to making life so grand. Well, it's got a million uses, beats all you've ever seen. You know, whenever you really think about it, there's not, there's something every day that people use that has soy in it, whether it be uh, milk and nearly every piece of chocolate candy that you eat has soy lecithin in it. So celebrating the diversity of the bean is the best way that we can like wrap our arms around what we try to do with the festival. We refer to it as the magic bean and of us creating magic for the festival. The Tennessee Soybean Festival is the first soybean themed festival in the USA. 25 years ago, the local citizens raised enough funds to start this festival dedicated to soybeans. 25 years later, about 30,000 people are watching the Miss Soybean Festival pageant and singing soybeans praises in the parade. Just creatures for the soybean, hero of the land, from humblest beginnings, make your life so grand. The soybean song was, uh, it's interesting how that happened because my co-writer, he said, you know, Jim, this soybean festival is a big thing. We need to write a song for it. So I said, sounds good, let's do it. And they really liked it. We kept being asked to come back every year. And so this will be the 10th year that we're doing it. Soybeans are celebrated in the USA through such festivals, which are enjoyed by people of all ages. Children see soybeans as the magic bean and are taught to respect and trust this plant species. Soybeans have endeared themselves to people here and rooted themselves quietly in people's hearts. You'll find them growing in the farmer's fields across West Tennessee. They bring new life to rural towns. They feed our economy. This is the most glorious moment of the year for soybeans. Interestingly, people gave them the cold shoulder when they were first introduced to this foreign land more than 200 years ago. This is the farmer's room which gives a little history of local farming in this area. We're here about soybeans. In 1765, when China was ruled by the Qing Dynasty, soybeans were brought to America by the British and used to make soy sauce. Unlike the Japanese, people here didn't show much enthusiasm towards this foreign plant. It was neither attractive nor high yield and was nicknamed the Chinese wild pea by the Americans in the 19th century. We are always uh, recognized that soybeans came from China, and we've had uh, situations where Tennessee researchers have gone to China and brought in other seed. In 1920, soybeans seized their first chance to increase their popularity in America 
Following the establishment of the American Soybean Association and the introduction of policies designed to protect soybean farmers, people started to show more interest in this crop. We farm about 4,000 acres of crops. We've been farming for many generations. My grandparents and parents have grown soybeans as one of our primary crops on this farm. Farmers labored on their lands and soybeans gradually became a major crop in America. But they still had a long way to go. Americans disliked the beany flavor of soybeans as a foodstuff. But meat lovers quickly realized that since soybeans were high in protein, they would make excellent animal feed. For a very long time, soybeans have been the major food source for chickens, cattle, pigs and turkeys in America. In the late 19th century, the soybean solidified its position as a beneficiary of America's unique advantages. Vast plains facilitated the development of industrial agriculture and advanced biotechnology enabled American farmers to propagate new varieties with higher yields. People also discovered that soybeans could actually help other crops grow better. alternate between corn and soybeans each year and we try to keep about half of our acres in each crop. The idea of rotating cotton and corn crops with soybeans was first proposed by a famous American chemist. Unlike other plants that suck nutrients away from the soil when they grow, soybeans can make the soil more fertile because they coexist with rhizobia which are bacteria that can fix nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and turn it into a more readily useful form of nitrogen inside the roots of the legume. After the seeds of the soybeans germinate, the rhizobia infect the roots of the seedlings to form root nodules that can fix nitrogen. While absorbing nutrients like carbohydrates and water from the legume host. When soybeans flower and grow seeds, each of the root nodules works like a factory producing nitrogen, which is then exported to the plant host to boost its growth. After the seeds mature, soybeans roots, stems, leaves, and the root nodules hidden underground will decompose and return to the soil as a natural organic fertilizer. People see the soybean as a species with a big heart. With the help of root nodules, they give back what they take from the soil. It is estimated that the total area of soybean plantations in the world reached 124 million hectares in 2017. Soybeans have endeared themselves to people as a friend rather than a crop. They are a miracle of nature and carry the spirit of home. Soybeans always remind me of my hometown the small South Korean village I lived in when I was a kid. I had a close relationship with soybeans when I was little. I ate them and played with their seeds. There's an emotional bond between us. Soybeans are plain, but when they are painted by a skillful hand, they become the embodiment of loving memories. Although soybeans come in different colors, the yellow ones chime best with people's image of a golden autumn. So when autumn arrives and it's time to harvest the beans, it must be a blissful experience to watch the golden yellow soybean fields packed with all those mature, seed-bearing plants.
Soybeans have fed our bodies as well as our minds. Meanwhile, people have been trying to push the boundaries of this valued crop through selective breeding. China is the native land of the soybean and is still where most of its varieties grow. Now, people are trying to improve the species through a new method. Soybeans produce seed packs with nutrients to maximize their chances of survival. Like many other plants, soybeans reproduce through pollination between male and female flowers, making seeds that will grow into new plants. The soybean is a self-pollinating plant and pollination occurs before its flowers have fully opened. This is a soybean flower magnified 10 times and 20 times respectively. The anther and stigma stand close to each other and the pollen grains are just a step away from the stigma. A gentle touch allows the pollen to transfer to the stigma, fertilizing the egg. The advantage of self-pollination is that the plant doesn't need to rely on wind or insects to achieve fertilization, but the downside is that it may lead to the weakening of the variety, thereby affecting the quality of its offspring. Humans are trying to help soybeans achieve cross-pollination to produce healthier offspring and new varieties. But this seems to be an impossible mission. My mentor was the best in the field, but he thought it was too difficult and refused to try. I tried nevertheless. The structure of the soybean flower is designed to induce self-pollination if we want to ensure that cross-pollination happens, there is only one way. We must make sure that the flower doesn't produce any pollen grains at all. It's possible that there are infertile male soybean plants in the wild, but where on earth can they be found? I believe that if infertile male plants did exist in the wild, then they were probably in China, because China is where most of the soybean varieties originated both domesticated and wild varieties. If an infertile variety existed, we would probably be the first ones to find it. To make sure he didn't miss a single variety, Sun Huang visited all the provinces where soybeans usually grew, from Jiangsu in the south to Jilin in the north. Two years later, Sun Huang was amazed when he found male plants in a test field in Hunan that were potentially infertile. It sounded like something that was too good to be true. Sun Huang was astonished by his own luck. I thought it would take much longer to find an infertile variety. I couldn't believe that I was this lucky. But Sun Huang and his team still had years to wait. He noticed that some of the male plants might grow to be infertile. And he told me that we would need to wait five years before we could find out whether his hunch was right. After repeated experiments, Sun Huan and his team harvested the seeds that would grow into infertile male plants in 1993, making the first breakthrough in the cultivation of hybrid soybeans in China. However, it is not enough to have flowers that don't produce pollen. Someone still needs to play the role of the pollinator. Wind pollination was eliminated because soybeans produce a small amount of pollen. It's too heavy to be carried by the wind and the flowers are too small. Sun Huang and his team tried hand pollination and realized that wasn't the best way either. 
If you are experienced, you can hand pollinate 200 flowers in a day, and the success rate will still only be 30 to 40 percent. You would inevitably touch the stigma during hand pollination, and very often you would end up damaging the stigma, killing it. We tried our best, but the success rate was far from satisfactory. Since hand pollination was not favourable, Sun decided to seek the help of an insect friend. The oldest species of bee lived during the Cretaceous period, more than 100 million years ago, when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth. Now, the fierce dinosaurs are dead and gone, but the bees are still around. Bees are the friends of many flowering plants. Would bees and soybeans, who have been strangers for so long, become friends with the help of humans? Humans are much cleverer than bees, but cleverness alone is not enough to get the job done. Bees live in well-organised colonies, and they're much more disciplined than we can ever imagine. Virgin Queen Bee is about to emerge from her cell. Worker bees swarm around the cell, awaiting her appearance. She will break out of her cell in a couple of hours. Majesty has arrived. She begins to inspect her kingdom, surrounded by her attentive servants. Some of the servants are responsible for feeding the queen royal jelly when necessary. Others are tasked with cleaning the queen's body. This little beehive is a world managed with skillful precision. The bees know exactly where their duty lies and what is expected of them. Nectar collected from flowers is turned into honey, which sustains this little colony. Worker bees are busy collecting nectar every day to keep their world running. They fly out together as a swarm, heading straight to their targets. Each one seems to know exactly what they are doing. It's a hot day today, isn't it? Come on, guys. Come out, all of you. Come on out. Come on out. Don't be shy. Come on. There you are. Say hello to your new home. They're feeling hot. They're fanning themselves with their wings. They'll fly around and see how big this space is and work out where the boundaries are. These are young bees and they're out scouting. They're measuring the space they're in. And they'll start working once they settle into their new home. While the bees are collecting nectar, pollen grains will stick to their bodies, like their heads or chests, and then they bring it back with them. They don't do any harm to the flowers at all. They're very efficient. 
I'm grateful to the bees. This greenhouse is a key platform for soybean breeding. If I didn't have these bees working for me, we wouldn't be where we are now. This is a beautiful cooperative effort between soybeans, bees and humans, with a lot of emotions invested in it. The bees work for us, so we should treat them nicely and take care of them. They're good at this job, better than a team of thousands of people. If we try to hand pollinate all the greenhouses, we would need several thousand people, or even more. However, we can't keep soybeans in the greenhouses forever. Sooner or later, they will have to return to the open fields, where the bees will be distracted by the flowers of other species. Will soybean flowers still be their first choice? Soybean flowers don't have much competitiveness in the wild. Their flowers are lacking in nectar, pollen grains and fragrance, making them less attractive to bees. So, what can be done to attract the bees to the soybean flowers? Agricultural scientists turn to etymologists for help. Go Feng Cheng and his team have been studying bees for more than 40 years and knows this little insect inside and out. How to cross-pollinate soybeans has always been a challenge. The biggest problem is that it's such a time-consuming process to breed a new variety. But farms need new varieties that have higher yields. So it's our job to make that happen. After years of research, scientists finally developed an attractant. With the help of this attractant, bees have now become the soybean's loyal companion. We put plates of attractants in the soybean fields every day between 7 and 8 a.m. We shake the plates to release the fragrance so that the bees will stay in the soybean fields. Generally speaking, bees are loyal creatures. If they can find enough nectar in soybean flowers, they won't bother visiting flowers of other species. Of all the animal pollinators, only bees have this sense of loyalty, which is exactly what the soybeans need. With human assistance, Bees and soybean plants have established a close relationship and this alliance makes the mass production of hybrid soybeans possible. In fact, another pleasant surprise awaits both humans and soybeans on a certain piece of land in China. With a hot and dry climate, Ili Prefecture in Xinjiang is likely to make an ideal home for soybeans. When hybrid soybeans were first introduced here, people were astonished by how well the plant was received by this field. Many other plant species live here, but it seems that they have reached an agreement to help attract bees as pollinators for the soybeans but never compete with the soybeans for attention. This is camel grass, and bees love its fragrant flowers. It blossoms before the soybeans, so it attracts bees and makes the field a popular destination for the insect. When the soybeans flower, the camel grass won't compete for the bees' attention. The camel grass thrives here, meaning we don't need to plant anymore. This one is known as the bitter bean in China. It's in full bloom now. All kinds of bees swarm here. This is sweet clover, the most common plant here. Insect pollinators frequent this area because of it. The bitter bean's flowering season is over. The sweet clover is producing seeds now. 
Only the flowers on top are still open. Most of the pollinators are focusing on the soybean flowers. <laughs> as well as the plants that flower before the soybeans, the sunflowers here choose to flower after the soybeans to avoid distracting the bees' attention from pollination, as if they are also bound by an agreement. In this region, soybeans don't even need to rely on attractants to make the bees stay. These local plants have formed a mutual alliance with the soybeans and bees, coexisting in harmony. I think we're very close to achieving the industrial production of hybrid beans. It's taken us 30 years to get to this place and I never expected to see this happen in the first year. With the help of bees and humans, the soybean plantations in Ili were blessed with a bumper harvest in 2018. With the development of new soybean varieties in northeast China in 2013, local farmers are already seeing significant profits. The domestication of soybeans started in China thousands of years ago. And after decades of development, they have now been established as a major crop in the USA. Now, people in their native land are busy developing new cultivars of this plant. Currently, there are 31,039 domesticated varieties and 9,685 wild varieties of soybean seeds stored in the germplasm bank of crop species. China is where soybeans originated from and also where they are marching towards a brighter future. If people were to select a national plant hero for China, soybeans would be nominated. Here are the reasons why. As a plant that once grew in the wild, soybeans spent thousands of years learning how to grow upwards for the sake of mankind. They have colorful flowers, including red, white, and blue. Their roots can fix nitrogen in the soil and act as a natural organic fertilizer. Their seeds are packed with protein, making them perfect animal feed, and they're used extensively in our own cuisines too. These beans have shaped human civilizations. They are known as the magic bean in the West and used as the main ingredient for a signature dish in Japanese cuisine. They have made new friends in their homeland and they have produced new varieties. They are unpretentious, but they are an invaluable gift bestowed on us by nature. Let's all remember its name, the soybean, from the genus Glycine in the bean family Fabaceae.